Hi, my name is Gail Hausman. I'm a nurse with the ALS Association, Greater Philadelphia Chapter, and I'm here to talk about what is ALS. Specifically, we're going to define ALS and have some sense of how we deal with ALS, look at common signs and symptoms of the disorder, have some knowledge regarding treatment, and be aware of some of the psychosocial factors associated with ALS. To start with the definition, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, is a fatal progressive neuromuscular disorder that causes eventual paralysis of all voluntary muscles. So most folks have, have heard of Lou Gehrig, a famous baseball player in this country, um, he was, uh, he had symptoms of ALS in his early 30s and he dropped out of baseball and um, he died somewhere in his, in his, in his mid-30s. And in this country, the illness, we call it Lou Gehrig's disease, but all over the world it's known as either ALS or motor neuron illness. We consider it fatal because the average life expectancy after diagnosis is two to five years. About 10% of all people with ALS live greater than 10 years, but most people die within the two to five year range. Big word that I, that I wanna point out is the word progressive because ALS usually starts in a limb, an arm or a leg, and then eventually if the person lives long enough, he or she will not be able to move any voluntary muscles, will not be able to um, speak, chew, swallow, or breathe on their own because eventually all of these muscles become affected by ALS. So what happens with, with ALS? Our nervous system starts in our brain and goes into the spine and then we have all these nerves that shoot out. From, from the spine. Some of these nerves are called motor nerves or motor neurons. The motor nerves are connected to the voluntary muscles and it's the nerves job to stimulate the muscle. So if there's no stimulation of the muscle, the muscle would weaken and eventually atrophy or waste. And I want to show you the muscles that are involved with, with ALS. These are all of our voluntary muscles. These are all the, the, the muscles affected by uh, uh, the motor nerve. And that would be the arms, hands, legs, feet, chest, abdomen, back, neck. So if somebody doesn't have good neck con control, you know, their neck is going to be down here. Throat and mouth, we use these muscles to chew and swallow and, and to speak. The tongue is a voluntary muscle, so that becomes affected. The face, and most importantly, the diaphragm and the other muscles that, that we use to take a breath in are eventually affected by ALS. So the motor nerves die, and then the muscle that they're connected to dies. So eventually, again, people become paralyzed from the top of their head all the way down to their, to, their, to their toes. The usual cause of death is respiratory failure because the breathing muscles, the diaphragm and the other muscles that we use to take a breath in no longer work. This is a diagram of uh, where the um, motor nerve starts in the frontal section of the brain and it shoots the signal into the spine. And, and from there, the nerves go out to all the various muscles. So ALS occurs all over the world. It occurs roughly one to two per 100,000 people. So if you live in a town of 100,000 people, we would expect to see one to two cases of ALS. There have been reported clusters, is what they call it, of ALS, and that would be greater than one to two per, per 100,000 people. So there is a known cluster of anybody that has served in the military, whether this person has seen active combat or not, and any branch of the military, there is a cluster of ALS. Those folks are two to four per 100,000 people. So anybody in the military is twice as likely
to get ALS, and they don't know why. But the Department of Defense is looking into that, and in a little bit, Brenda Edelman will be, will be talking about that. ALS is more common in men until the age of 65, and then it equals out, and, and they're not sure why. Um, it peaks between the ages of 40 to 70, which means that, that most people that get a ALS are between the ages of 40 to 70. However, we unfortunately see actually teenagers, late teenagers, you know, that get a ALS, and we've had people in their, in their 90s diagnosed with, with ALS. So it, you know, it varies as far as age. About 5 to 10 percent of all people with ALS have the familial form. That's the FALS that's, that's listed, and that's called familial ALS. And that means that they've been able to identify at least one blood relative that had the illness and passed it on. If the person with ALS has the familial form of ALS, um, any of their children have roughly a 50% chance of developing the illness, unfortunately. So diagnosis often takes a long time. Um, one, there has to be a history of pro progression. The person has to, you know, uh, over a period of time get, get weaker and weaker. Two, a trained neuromuscular specialist, which is a neurologist who specializes in these type of disorders, a trained neuromuscular specialist can pick out certain signs on exam. Um, they do a whole uh, slew of um, blood work, CAT scans, MRIs, everything has to come out negative. And they have to, you, you have to have a positive EMG which is the test that they do when they stick needles in the muscles and from there they can tell if part of the motor neuron system is affected. So ALS does not affect any of the involuntary muscles. So, so our organs are all covered by involuntary muscles, our heart, our liver, our kidneys. So they wouldn't be affected. Um, it only affects the voluntary muscles. So ALS does not affect the bowel and bladder. However, most people are constipated because they're not moving and they're not eating and drinking the, the same kinds of foods and fluids that they have in the past. Um, it's not supposed to affect the bladder, but a lot of our folks have urinary frequency and urgency. So when they have to go, they have to go. Um, it does not affect sexual functioning, and that's because it doesn't affect the senses. Um, a lot of people ask me, what's the difference between ALS and MS? And there's a lot of differences. But one of the big differences is that MS affects the sensory nerves. So the senses would be seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, and hearing. And so all of those senses can become affected with, M with MS, but not with ALS. So as far as touching, people still feel pleasure and they still feel pain. So if you have a patient who has a paralyzed arm because of ALS, they can still feel their arm. If they're laying in bed for too long, they can feel the pressure on their, on their backside. Um, a lot of our patients, most of our patients do not have bed sores because they can still feel. The people that are paralyzed and can't feel are the ones that, that usually get, get the bed sores. So when I started about 12 and a half years ago at this ALS association, um, I was told that ALS never affects the person mentally. And since then, maybe about five, six years ago, the research is indicating that probably about 50% of all people with ALS have some cognitive impairment. It's usually mild, and it would involve um, the frontal section of the brain, which is involved in thinking, reasoning, and judging. So therefore, the person might not be uh, thinking as clearly, or there might be some change in personality or there might be some behavior that's sort of not, not typical for that patient. Um, in the extreme case of this, um, it's called frontotemporal dementia, 
and about 5% of all people with ALS also get frontotemporal dementia. Um, this is also a progressive illness. Again, a ALS is progressive. The person will get worse and worse. Frontotemporal dementia, the person will get worse and worse mentally. So this person will have an extreme change in personality, disinhibited behavior, lack of judgment, They'll just do basically whatever they want to do. They almost act like um, kids. And so they need that kind of supervision, the same kind of supervision that, that, that you would get, give a child because they, they, don't, they don't think things through. They'll do behaviors that are really risky. Um, <clears throat> about 10% of all people who have frontotemporal dementia eventually develop symptoms of, a, of ALS. So there is a genetic connection between the two. So the cause of ALS, they really, uh, they don't know what, what causes ALS. They, there's lots of suspicions. They found a protein called the TDP43 protein. It's just like a mass that's sitting inside the motor neurons or motor nerves that might be sort of pl uh, plugging up the system. Um, but they don't know if that's the cause. They know that it's, that it's part of the problem. They do know in the familial form, which is the genetic form, 100% would be a genetic cause, meaning uh, genetic mu mutation would be the cause of it. Um, and they suspect that there's more of a genetic cause in the folks that don't have the familial form. And that would be called the sporadic form. So uh, what we're hearing in the literature now is that um, researchers believe that there is a genetic connection and that something triggers the motor neurons to start dying. The treatment. There's really only one FDA-approved drug that's been shown to slow the progression, and that's called Relutec. And the studies vary. Um, the, the, there's, there's several big studies on Relutec. Um, and the studies vary as far as um, decreasing pro progression um, from anywhere from three months to a year um, living longer, basically, or avoiding the need to have a tra tracheostomy is, is, the, is the end stage of that, of that study. Um, the primary treatment is palliative and that would be symptom management. And that's what a lot of folks do in nursing homes and in, and in the home. Um, at some point, with people who have ALS, eventually their breathing muscles are gonna become involved, and also their chewing and swallowing muscles are gonna become involved. And so we need to sit them down and have an honest and, and as kind as we can be explain to them that these you know, that these muscles are going to be dying and that they need to make some really tough choices. Um, as far as the um, uh, chewing and swallowing, do they want to have a, a feeding tube placed? And as far as the breathing, do they want to have invasive mechanical ventilation, which is when they, they open up the throat, they connect the tube here that goes to a big machine the ventilator and the machine does all of the work of the breathing muscles. Um, they certainly can elect that. Most people choose not to do that, but, but we do have about, I'd say about five to 10% of the people that we deal with elect to go that, that, that route. Um, what we need to tell people is, one, the disease continues to progress even with invasive mechanical ventilation. So the person on a ventilator might still be able to move their arms, or they might still be able to walk, or they might still be able to be fairly clear speaking, um, and eventually they, they too will become quadriplegic, unable to move any voluntary muscles. Usually the last muscle that dies is the um, moving of the eye muscles. Eventually people on a ventilator uh, have the possibility of becoming locked in and what that means is they have no way of communicating. Um, what we tell people who are choosing to go on an invasive mechanical ventilator is they have the option at any point to come off the ventilator. 
legally they are they are allowed to do that and usually we would bring in hospice and they would and they would help with that at times what our folks tell us that are are either considering going on a ventilator or um, are already on a ventilator is they want to be taken off the ventilator when they can no longer communicate and that's usually the eye movement so for instance um, when people have really advanced ALS, uh, the only way that we can communicate is by asking yes or no questions. So I would say, um, do you need to be turned in bed? Move your eyes to the right if this is what you would like. If they move their eyes to the right, I know that they want to be turned. Okay, that's, that's usually the end stage as far as um, losing, losing muscles. So what we primarily do is, is treat symptoms. And again, the, the voluntary muscles are dying. So just doing simple things are gonna, is, is going to take a lot of energy. Okay? So fatigue is a big symptom for these, for these folks. Um, so we tell them to sort of space out activities, to save their energy for things that are really important. Um, if, for instance, if they have trouble speaking and they're having dinner with guests, save your voice until dinner time. Um, if the person's still able to walk a little bit and taking the walk around the block is the most important thing in their life, then use your energy for that. What we tell caregivers, and, and a lot of times caregivers don't want to hear this, but what we tell them is you should be doing more of the work for these patients things that you can do versus having them do it. And I'll give you a perfect e example. We had a lady in a facility who, it would take her a long time, but she would brush her hair out because she had weakness in her arms and decreased movement in her joints. So, you know, it would take her a long time. They would bring her her tray and she didn't have enough strength left to feed herself. So the more important thing would have been for her to feed herself. So we said to the CNA, let's, why don't you take care of her hair and she can use her, her muscles to feed herself. It, a, a lot of times energy conservation is just <clears throat> common sense. It's just thinking ahead. Mobility. So most of the folks that we see usually have a weak limb, that would be arm or leg, or they might have some weakness here, so they would have trouble um, speaking and or chewing, swallowing. And rarely, but occasionally, their first symptom is trouble breathing. Okay, so most of our folks though, it's the arm or the leg, and they'll come in and they'll have just a weakness in one limb. So, you know, eventually they're gonna progress to a, to a cane, uh, and then a walker, and they might need to have braces. Um, eventually a, a wheelchair that somebody can push and then usually towards the end they need a power wheel, wheelchair or they might need it earlier in their illness if primarily their legs are affected. Um, so that's going to vary but again to keep in mind the illness is progressive and the other thing to keep in mind is um, the person that is not able to move his or her own joints needs to have range of motion exercises. So for instance, if I can still walk, but both of my arms, I can't move them beyond here, somebody's gonna need to do this for me, okay? I have muscle loss in both of these arms. Somebody needs to move my joints because if they don't, I'm gonna get con contractures. I'm gonna get frozen shoulders, and that's gonna hurt, and that's a preventable pain. So joints, um, all of the joints, any of the joints, fingers, wrists, elbows, shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, okay? Shortness of breath, pretty much every single one of our patients develops this, this symptom. Um, usually, uh, if they're laying flat, they need to put the head of the bed up. That's, that's, that's an early sign. Um, Again, the, the uh, breathing muscles are dying, okay? So we use a machine called, called a BiPAP. Uh, a BiPAP is a mask, and it's hooked up to a little box, and uh, this machine 
senses when the, ta when the person is taking a breath in and helps to have a bigger breath in. It, it, it's sort of an assistive device for the respiratory muscles. Okay, e eventually, um, I would say almost 100% of our folks get, get shortness of breath of some, some sort. Um, usually it's when they're lying flat and they need to elevate the head of their bed. And that's usually an early symptom of respiratory muscle weakness. You know, again, the respiratory muscles are not working as well. When you take a breath in, it's the respiratory muscles, the diaphragm, that get you to take the breath in. It's not the lungs them, themselves. You gotta have the muscles to make the breath go in, okay? So we talk about energy conservation again, and we just about always recommend a, a device called a BiPAP. And what a BiPAP is, is it's sort of like one of those sleep apnea ma machines. It's a, um, a box and a tube and, and you wear you know, a mask either in the, in, in, on the nose or in the nose or like a big mask. And um, it senses when you're taking a breath in and it helps you to take a better breath in. It's sort of like an assistive device for the respiratory muscles. It's not gonna do all of the work like a ventilator but it helps the respiratory muscles to take a better breath, breath in. So the person is moving air, okay? Um, a lot of our folks die as a result of, of pneumonia and they usually just pick up a cold. And for them, I mean, you and I, we get, we get, pneumonia, we get a cold and we just fight it off. These folks, um, you know, eventually, you know, unfortunately it goes into their lungs. Um, so we just ask that if you're caring for somebody who has ALS and you have a cold to either wear a mask or if, if possible um, see if somebody else can care for this person. Most of our folks develop swallowing problems and again they have to make a choice do, do they want a feeding tube or not. Um, for the folks that have swallowing problems and do not want a, a, a feeding tube we talk to them about tucking their chin when they're chewing and swallowing, okay? Chewing their food slowly, not talking and eating at the same, and chewing at the same time. A lot of us, when we, when we sit around, we might talk with, with food in our mouths. Um, so we talk to people about sort of concentrating on chewing and swallowing. Um, avoiding foods that, um, typically our folks have trouble with, which would be thin liquids and foods that have two different consistencies, like a vegetable soup. Because a vegetable soup would have the thin and would have the, you know, the chunky stuff. And if you have um, weakness here and a, and a tongue that isn't working, it, you know, it's sort of hard to get that into a, a, a mass of some sort to swallow carefully. So a lot of our folks um, are on softer foods or pureed foods. Um, we also, a lot, there's um, usually weight loss with, with ALS. So we talk about high protein shakes and you know, higher calorie, smaller, higher calorie meals. And we also, it's very important for all of the caregivers to know how to do the Heimlich. Speaking problems are gonna vary. Some folks are gonna start with this in their illness. Other folks may develop this as their illness progresses. Other folks may be able to speak okay. Um, they may not be able to project their voice because of the respiratory muscle involvement, but they can still speak clearly. Um, f there's all kinds of devices out there uh, and I'm not going to go through them all, but I can tell you that there's very, very low tech and very high tech and everything in, in between. Um, one of the things for folks that are having trouble speaking is we ask them to say the most important word, bathroom, instead of I want to go to the bathroom. Okay? We have them try to speak slowly. Um, again, we might need to do yes or no questions. We use something called a communication board for some folks. So we would say, is the first letter of the first word on the first line, move your eyes to the right if it is. Is it an A? Is it a B? So I know that it's a B word. And then you could have B words listed. Okay, and the person could just go over the word. 
Some people can still point, so they could use this as pointing. We have these types of boards also with pictures for folks who um, are, are not able to read. Um, and, for, and for people in nursing homes, there's all kinds of um, uh, call bells out there that can assist somebody who has like a weak limb. So like you could, there's call bells for the feet if they can still move their feet. There's call bells that you can use under the head. Um, so we would just wanna make sure that that particular patient has access to call for help. Some of the other problems that people with, with ALS have they don't have their muscle strength here, eventually, and so they're gonna have problems with secretions. So one of the things that they have is what we call sialuria, and that's drooling. You and I, when we have saliva in our mouths or too much saliva, we swallow it. We don't even think about it. These folks, they don't have the strength to do that, so they're gonna be dripping, okay? Um, the other problem that they're gonna have is sputum or mucus in their, in their, in their throats. Again, we have mucus in our throats, we clear it. These folks, it just sits there. So we use all kinds of medications and devices to help clear that. Um, some of our folks develop what's called pseudobulbar affect, and that's uncontrollable laughing or crying. And they can't help this. Something will set them off and they can't stop. It's very embarrassing for them. Um, and that can be easily treated, or fairly easily treated, with a couple of medications. Um, I was also told when I, when I started here that there's no pain involved with ALS, and that is absolutely not true. We have seen people have had problems with spasms, which are sort of like a, a, a muscle pulling kind of a feeling, particularly in their shoulders and in their back. They can have cramps, which are like a charley horse kind of a feeling, very often in the legs. They can have problems related to immobility. So if they're laying in the same spot and they're not moving, it's gonna hurt because again, these folks can, can feel. And they might have some numbness in their lower extremities, in their, in their feet. And we think that that too is related to immobility. Um, depression, as you can imagine, is very, very common with this, with this illness, and I don't think I need to go into that. Uh, just simply that these folks are losing one thing after another. Their bodies are basically failing. Um, and very often they have trouble sleeping for a variety of, of reasons. Um, if they're having trouble breathing, and they, even if they don't know it, if their respiratory muscles are not moving well, Okay, the flatter you are, the more difficult it is for that diaphragm to move well. So if you sit up higher, it's actually easier to breathe. Um, they can have pain, depression can cause in, in, insomnia. Um, what we try to do is figure out what is the cause and, and treat the cause. So just some of the psychosocial issue, issues, um, the fact that these people are, are dealing with a fatal illness, even if they elect to go on, a, on invasive mechanical ventilation, the average life expectancy on a ventilator for any illness is about eight years, okay? There might be some cognitive impairment. They have difficult decisions to make the biggest one, I think, is the ventilator or the, or the no ventilator. But other, other decisions, you know, where am I going to live? Who's going to care for me? What about finances? Um, and then the decision about whether or not to have a, have a feeding tube placed. So just some things to keep in mind, and I've said this over and over, the disease is pro progressive. So what a person or patient can do today, he or she may not be able to do tomorrow. Um, usually people who cannot speak are not impaired as far as their mental status. They're, they're still alert. They might have some cognitive impairment as far as judgment goes and thinking, but, they, but, they're, but they're still alert. So even though you have a patient who, who can't speak, uh, you need to speak to this person um, as you would any other person. And um, we, we try to get caregivers to allow the patients to direct as much of their care as possible. 
because this illness is about lack of control. Um, and we sometimes see that some of our patients become a little controlling, and we think that's because everything, they're, they're losing everything. So for instance, if they need a help with a shower and they need um, an hour of activity, give them the choice. Would you rather do the hour of activity now or would you rather take, take the shower now? You know, simple types of things. I am now going to turn over the presentation to Brenda Edelman, who is the Director of Patient Services for the ALS Association, Greater Philadelphia Chapter, and she will be talking about uh, some of the services that the chapter can do to help folks who have ALS and their loved ones. <laughs> 